Most people would agree that planting trees is good for the environment. The biological and ecological benefits of trees are a no-brainer. They absorb carbon dioxide and let out oxygen. That's also why they're considered a tool to fight climate change. Policymakers hope that if we plant more trees, they can absorb the excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and help reduce the pace of global warming. There are plenty of schemes in India that suggest our own policymakers feel similarly. Under the Green India mission, we set a long-term aim of increasing forest cover to 33% of India's geographical area. The National Afforestation Policy, which was recently merged with the GIM, aims to plant more trees and restore ecologically degraded forests. Then there's the Compensatory Afforestation Fund Act, which says that all forests cut down for non-forest purposes, like developmental projects, have to be compensated for, and those trees must be regrown, even if it's in a patch of land that isn't a forest. But how effective are large-scale tree plantations when it comes to reducing climate change? This video aims to answer that question. My name is Simran Sirur, and you're watching Tipping Point. Right now, India's forest cover stands at about 21.67% of the total geographical area. And even though we're aiming high at 33%, our progress has been really slow. In 1987, our forest cover was 19.49%. So in 32 years, our forest cover grew just 2.18%. In recent years, the government has been trying to speed up this process by introducing all these schemes. We even made a promise at the COP21 to plant enough trees to absorb 2.5 to 3 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. To give you an idea of how much that is, our current forest and tree cover is absorbing about 7.124 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. To absorb another 2.5 to 3 billion tons, the Energy and Resources Institute estimates that we may need to almost double our current forest cover. But here's an important question. What if it doesn't work? I spoke to Harry Fisher, Associate Professor in the Department of Urban and Rural Development at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, Uppsala. He also co-authored a paper of a recent study from Kangra district in Himachal Pradesh, which found that large-scale tree plantations didn't actually significantly improve canopy cover or carbon sequestration, which is the absorption of carbon dioxide. Well, I think there's little doubt from an ecological and biological perspective that trees sequester carbon. Uh, the science on that is pretty settled. Um, the question is about what happens when large-scale tree plantations are implemented by governments and in contexts where there is a very large human presence. And that is what we investigate in our study. And what we found was that Looking over three decades of tree plantations in Himachal Pradesh, um, in the Kangra district, showed no statistically significant improvement in forest cover, uh, which is obviously a counterintuitive finding. Um, but basically what we did to show this is we went around and we mapped the tree plantations that the government had undertaken, the forest department had undertaken, and we sent our field teams to the villages. They went and located the plantations. They walked around them with GPS units. So then we had um, uh, sort of geospatial locations for those plantations. And then we can look at satellite imagery to see if uh, forest cover had changed over time. And there was a great deal of variation. Some of them had increased and some had decreased, um, but on average, we see no statistically significant increase. Okay. So the question is, um, can, can they uh, help fight climate change? And the answer is, the right tree in the right place can be a very good thing. Um, but when you have large-scale, target-driven government programs, there's a lot of reasons to suspect that they may not be as effective as uh, we might otherwise expect. The study also found that tree plantations didn't improve the livelihoods of the communities living around the afforested land. One of the reasons it may not work, the study says, is because these tree plantations are target-driven, with little attention given to the long-term sustenance of these growths. Another is that tree plantation drives don't necessarily address the underlying reasons for degradation. A third is that these tree plantations happened in areas that already had some tree cover. One thing I would say is that uh, an effect, we should probably stop treating tree plantations 
as being um, a, a, a certain technical solution where we can just simply plant trees and this will solve our problem. In reality, I think that tree plantations um, are really a social problem because they are often planted in landscapes that are used by people. So we need to find ways in which we plant trees that protect and align with local resource needs and local land use practices that ideally would work with communities to try to incentivize the growth of these trees and try to make sure that local people have a stake um, in making sure that they grow over time. I also spoke to Anand Osuri, a scientist with the Nature Conservation Foundation, who's led several studies in forest restoration work and has seen how it can improve both forest cover and carbon storage. Forest restoration, he says, is about looking at what factors are preventing a forest from growing, while afforestation is about growing trees where there may not be forest land at all. And he stresses that you don't necessarily need to plant trees for a forest to restore. The ecological restoration project that I work in and that we have written about uh, does several things uh, that are not typical uh, uh, comparable to large-scale uh, tree planting missions as they exist today. Uh, one is uh, we have paid attention to selecting a wide diversity of native tree species, uh, rearing them uh, to a fairly large size in a nursery and then planting them out uh, in sites that are prepared, uh, taking into account uh, the control of invasive plants uh, and other site conditions that might need some form of management before the trees were planted. And uh, we have continued uh, in most cases to monitor those planted saplings over uh, a four to five year window and even further, even longer uh, to keep track of survival and to intervene if necessary. Sometimes when we have experienced a lot of saplings dying out at a site, uh, we have gone and replanted those sites. So our effort uh, is fairly intensive. Uh, and by the very nature of that effort, it becomes a challenge uh, to scale up uh, in, in, the, in the same vein to much larger scale efforts. Okay. Having said that, uh, and you know, circling back to the beginning of our conversation, not always does one need to plant trees to assist a forest in regrowing. Uh, it might, there might be other factors that could be more easily managed uh, that might play a critical role. I mentioned invasive plants as one uh, and their control. Uh, there might also be other things to be looked at, for example, nutrients in the soil, uh, the management of uh, fire and livestock grazing, uh, or, finding alternatives to people's livelihood needs. Uh, for example, finding ways to reduce people's dependence on fuel wood that are harvested from forests are all important measures that can uh, contribute to restoring a forest even without having to plant a single tree. Uh, and so I, I, I think, you know, one thing to take forward is we need to pay more attention to what are the barriers that are preventing a forest from recovering on its own and finding cost-effective ways of reducing those barriers with an emphasis on bringing back native tree species, native plant species, and native biodiversity uh, more than simply planting trees that may not even be appropriate for an ecosystem. While it's true that in theory, growing more forests can help climate change, planting trees on land that may have other uses could harm not only the ecology of that land, but also lead to displacement among indigenous communities occupying that area. There are many parts of the country where rainfall is too low uh, naturally for trees to occur uh, at high density. So many of our grasslands uh, or open savannas, uh, which house a lot of very unique species of plants and wildlife, uh, charismatic large wildlife like the Indian wolf, uh, like the Indian bustard, our species that depend heavily on these open natural ecosystems. Uh, 
And these are also important ecosystems from the point of view of uh, grazing livestock, pastoral human communities also have a long cultural and economic dependency on these ecosystems. Planting trees in such ecosystems can be detrimental both to biodiversity and to the people that depend on these ecosystems. Uh, but there are several examples of where uh, this has happened in the past and continues to happen. Because uh, logically, if you look at our stated missions of expanding forest cover, uh, we would have to obviously look at places that don't have forest at the moment. Uh, the majority of these spaces are already under some form of intensive human use, primarily agriculture. So then what we are left with, are what you also just mentioned, uh, are lands that are called wastelands, uh, which are actually very often these kind of treeless uh, or, or sparsely tree covered open natural ecosystems. Uh, and so there would be several examples from, for example, the state of Rajasthan or Gujarat yeah. or parts of Maharashtra, Karnataka, any of our more arid uh, spaces are where these tree planting uh, uh, missions are happening and can be detrimental. Both Harry and Anand say more studies are needed to look into the effectiveness of large-scale tree plantations but also that their current implementation needs to be looked at again. For more videos like this one, do subscribe to The Print.